the civilized world reels beneath the news that Singapore, proud impregnable bastion, will fall. One of the last ships Following the fall of Singapore 60 years ago, stories began to trickle home, stories that have never gone away. It was Australians. And they were pushing the woman off to go into the boat. Tonight, Four Corners confronts the big questions that emerged from the debacle that ended the British Empire. Why were Allied forces so comprehensively defeated? And how much was desertion among Australian troops to blame? I believe the Australians were the first to desert in any great numbers. This British author has named alleged Australian deserters we go in search of them. So, is it fair to say that you are a self-confessed deserter? No. Sixty years on, is the Singapore story still too discomforting? The loss of Singapore means leaving Australia at that time, white Australia, open, naked and vulnerable to the Asiatic hordes who could potentially walk into the big empty land and extinguish European civilization on the Australian continent. I think it was a bad shock that Australia has never really moved away from entirely. Sixty years on, how much do we live with scandal as well as the greatest defeat in Australian military history? to be found here on this beach where Australians were fighting and dying before the first shots were fired at Pearl Harbor. I dropped a couple of bombs uh, on the first one which I think straddled it but on the second one we we seem to have hit it right in the middle with two two bombs and there was a terrific explosion so we knew that we'd, we'd done the job on it. <laughs> I was among the first troops who landed. Eventually, only one third of us made it through. The Japanese attack was part of a Pacific blitzkrieg designed to extinguish American power and overwhelm British and Dutch colonies. The landing at Kota Baru was part of a three pronged attack on Malaya. The Japanese plan to capture Singapore in 100 days. In Kota Baru, we captured the airport. After we captured the Malayan airports, our fighters would be able to reach Singapore in five minutes. Ashes, for the love of God, Ashes. And for three and a half thousands. Well, it looked, you know, to me, thousands of them. Uh, columns, not Ashes. God damn, my God. I see your poison never hold this lot up. The Allied airfields in Malaya had been located without consideration of the Army's ability to defend them. And when the Navy put to sea to meet the Japanese, there was no air force to protect them struggling to keep up with the British capital ships Prince of Wales and Repulse was the World War I vintage Australian destroyer, Vampire. We couldn't even fire a gun because the old guns we had on board were, were, were lashed up around about 19, 16, 17 and they only had a, a 35 degree elevation and of course like, it was a waste of time firing them. The Prince of Wales and Repulse were gone, sunk in a matter of minutes by Japanese aircraft. 
then the water was devastation. Like uh, being a big ship like that, the, the, the oil fuel which they run on, it, it's come out and spewed all over the ocean. In in amongst them was the uh, how would you put it, the, the survivors and those who did not survive. Stronghold, naval base, strategic centre, Singapore is above all one of the ramparts of that freedom for which the British Empire stands. Founded in 1819... Two days into the war, the much-vaunted Singapore strategy was looking pale. Torpedo carriers, such as smashed the Italian fleet at Taranto, practice in the Straits of Johor. For ten years, British and Australian propaganda had thundered the might of these outpost defences. Yes, Singapore is well-equipped and prepared to deal with anything which may arise in the Far East. I think it fooled a lot of the public, it fooled some politicians who found in that promise the sort of assurance uh, that got them, got them off the hook from thinking more deeply about the very difficult problems of regional defence in, in this part of the world. The Japanese certainly weren't fooled. They knew very well how pregnable the fortress was. Uh, Whitehall and, and the British government certainly weren't fooled. They knew very well that they were using uh, an image and a myth to try and take the place of substance that wasn't there. And again, to be frank, neither was Canberra. The Japanese had attacked when Britain had its back to the wall resisting Germany. Australia, too, had given priority to the war in Europe, committing three of its four divisions to the Middle East. The remaining 8th Division was made up of the best of the rest. Oh, it was made up of absolutely wonderful Australians, which are now almost an extinct race, I think. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of country chaps, They're absolutely marvellous types of people, just marvellous. Fifteen-years-old Bill Young, orphaned and on the road through a tough depression, was one of many looking for a job. Oh, I remember that first night in, uh, in the tent. Oh, lovely straw palace, you know, and blankets, and you didn't even have to get up till six o'clock in the morning, you know. The period spent in fighting by soldiers and sailors is very short, compared with the period spent in training and battles. In desperate times and short of experienced leaders, General Gordon Bennett was prematurely promoted to their command. Fractious and unforgiving, the World War I hero was in uniform to make war, not friends. He was a very ambitious man, a very determined man, very protective of the sovereignty and the independence of the Australian Imperial Force. And I think he had military ideas that were rather outdated. Australians are in the Far East, to us the near north. With war clouds hovering over the Pacific, Britain's forces in the Singapore area have been strengthened by the arrival of a large body of Australian troops. When the ships sailed north, the 8th Division was top-heavy with field hospitals and transport units, and short one of its three fighting brigades. They weren't to know it, but the 8th Division would, for all of World War II, carry Australia's heaviest burden of suffering and dying. I had never been anywhere. And to go over to this exotic east, and it was exotic. They were all foreigners over there. They even spoke foreign, you know. <laughs> and, uh, we were the only true people, the Englishmen there, really, or English-speaking people. Singapore and Malaya were important economic outposts of the British Empire, but Britain had made little effort to know its colony, the whites living separate lives. 
the citizens of Singapore erected the club as a tribute to the men from the south who stand to arms in the tropics. Malaya seeks Behind no the trouble. propaganda was resentment of the aggressively arrogant Australians. We were on five shillings a day, that was 50 cents. It doesn't seem much now, but it was a fortune to me, especially to me, to buy all the comics and tobacco and all that you wanted. You know, <laughs> it was terrific. And uh, um, we, when we got there with this five shillings, they put it up to six shillings, 60 cents. And the Englishman got a shilling. There are also small and probably not very important things, which at the time were very irritating. Uh, the Australian meat ration was vastly bigger than that of the Indian and British armies, for instance, and that really seems to have gotten up the nose of the officer, the, the staff officers in Malaya Command. Most discordant of all was the relationship right at the top. General Officer Commanding Malaya, the gentlemanly Arthur Percival, was not a good fit with the abrasive Gordon Bennett. He was extremely rude to Percival and Co, which uh, didn't endear him to them and then didn't smooth relations between them at all. Uh, unnecessarily rude, you know, we used to feel ashamed of him. Before the fighting began, the Australians took up positions in the southern Malay provinces of Malacca and Johor, where they were some of the few allied units to familiarise themselves with a supposedly impenetrable jungle. There was other regiments in Singapore, like the Gordons, the Manchesters, East Surreys, but they were all garrison troops. They were just doing their da di da in Singapore. They are not in actual action, but ranging their 25-pounder. Perhaps here the enemy will be held. Perhaps destiny holds for another Australian army the opportunity of greatness. Even after the fighting began, complacency and self-delusion remained the order of the day throughout an uncoordinated Malaya command. Tin mines in the north. There must be no more Penang. It is a shameful name in this war, declares the London Independent Press. We never seen a plane of ours. At the very, very start, we had some Brewster Buffaloes. You could have passed them on a bicycle, very, very slow, and as this went up, they were just um, shot down. Our intelligent people were still telling us that the Japanese couldn't see, they couldn't shoot, they were short-sighted, their gear was no good, it was made in Japan, and we'd all <laughs> laugh. You know? The Allies found the Japanese easily penetrated the impenetrable jungle. The Japanese brought tanks the British said could not operate in the boggy tropics. Oh, can't use tanks up there. What the hell is this? <laughs> That's true. Couldn't use tanks. Everything that is said couldn't be done, the Japanese did. Tired Indians, after weeks of fighting, moved back through the advancing Australians. Some of them the brunt of the early ground fighting was borne by Indian troops supported by British officers. The Japanese used speed to unsettle their enemy. They did not stop and wait for supply trucks, stealing bicycles and food to keep up their forward momentum. Small boats the British failed to destroy were also appropriated. Ownership of the air and the surrounding sea lanes meant the Japanese could move behind the Allies at will. The war was more than a month gone when the Japanese approached the Australian positions. The Johor battleground would be a tangle of jungle, roads and rubber plantations. We could do anything providing we didn't hurt the trees. <laughs> they were private property. They belonged to the firms, Dunlop and all these people, Goodyear and all these people. So we'd go charging around there and we could hurt people, and <laughs> hurt ourselves, but not those rubber trees. <laughs> Hands off the rubber trees. <laughs> General Percival's Malaya command, under attack from General Bennett for a withdrawal mentality, handed control of the ground forces in Johor to the Australian. 
He was a very bombastic individual, and, and uh, he was going around telling everybody that uh, I can't wait to get at them, um, let them come at us and we'll have them, you know, to, and some of his soldiers uh, caught this, uh, you know, the, the famous phrase is, um, we, I can fit two of them on one, on, on one bayonet. He did not work harmoniously, not with his own fellow Australians, not with the British, not with anybody. And uh, I don't think the problem was so much British-Australian relations with Bennett being the leader of a Dominion contingent and having constitutional duties. I think the problem was Bennett just being an idiot. Bennett chose to ambush the Japanese here near Gemis. There is not much left of the old Gementia Bridge where the New South Wales 2nd 30th Battalion, backed up by Queenslanders, planned to stop the Japanese. Now, our task was to take out any trucks that come through. So I imagine uh, the surprise we got when my mate gave me a nudge, Brownie, go, you go, look there, and there's all these Japanese peddling along on push bikes. Hundreds were let past before the bridge was blown and the killing begun. It was a hell of a noise, because everyone had satchels of grenades and they just dropped him over the over into the gutters and into the roadway. roadway. And uh, I fired till I couldn't find any more, nothing to fire at. Some of these uh, bikes were blown through people and heads off. And, uh, Horrific. Believing the propaganda that one Australian was as good as ten Japanese, Ray Brown went forward with his bayonet. Anyhow, I got one in the back. The other three jumped out, attacked me, and I got another one in the went for his throat, got him in the in, in the rib cage here. And while I'm trying to kick him off, the other two jumped on me, knocked me into the gutter and one bloke tried to throttle me. And um, well, this is not very good, Brown, so I felt around and I've, while he's trying to choke me, I'm half blacked out, but I felt, ah, oh, he, there's his bayonet. And I pulled that out and cut him through the jugular and he fell on top of me. So I couldn't move. And so the old, other Japs there come stabbing. And I got 20, 22 stab wounds. The ambush here at Gemis killed many Japanese, but was not the intended success. The rest of the battalion was quite a long way back, and uh, so the Jap tactic, as soon as he met this opposition, fanned out either side, and uh, streams didn't, uh, didn't worry them. They got across them by hook or by crook. More Japanese were soon across the bridge and in front of the Australians who staged a fighting withdrawal through the rubber plantations. Ray Brown, wounded 22 times but still breathing, was rescued by retreating comrades. Lieutenant Geeky said, put some band-aids on him, not band-aids, uh, what used they call them, wound dressings field dressings. He said, Jesus, Geeky, where will I start? <laughs> the Japanese later said the Australians fought with a bravery not previously encountered. You yell your head off and you go at the, the port side and you run like hell at the enemy. Uh, and it was terrific to see it. And it was terrific to see the Japs go to shoot through. If the enemy was going to use dense bush, then that meant supporting artillery wasn't going to be all that useful. How to counter that? Get right in their face. So you had a conjunction of two things here, the Japanese needing to go fast and pushing hard, the Australians needing to counteract the jungle covering the Japanese and wanting to bayonet them through the ribs as a means to do that. Throughout the entire campaign, the Allies took no more than 12 Japanese alive. The Australians knew they were in a take-no-prisoner, leave-no-wounded war. In action, they were just ruthless. They'd kill everything that moved. Well, when all said and done, I suppose that's war, isn't it? 
the more you leave, the more there is to come back at you. They would uh, gammon dead and have a grenade under their body with a, because as far as they were concerned, they were dead if they were taken prisoners. But they'd uh, roll one over, lift him over, and a grenade could explode in your face. To the west of Gemis, the Japanese began a pincer attack designed to cut off and kill the last line of defence. Here on the Muir front, the fighting would be even more grim. Australian artillery, ranged against the elite Japanese guards, fired at point-blank range. We made a hell of a mess of them and landed a lot of rounds there. We had to eventually pull out because there were too many of them. Supporting the artillery were members of the Victorian 2nd 29th Battalion, seen here before the fighting. The 2nd 29th would emerge from the Muir front a shadow of its former self. It soon became apparent that the Japanese were trained to, their snipers were to pick out anyone who looked like command, a commander. So most of our officers copped it right in the first go. An Indian brigade patched together with poorly trained soldiers was also in support. As soon as the heat turned on, they didn't know what to do. They finished up a lot of them, running off, throwing their rifles away, and taking their boots off and running like hell. A ferocious battle was soon underway in defence of this important road junction at Bakri. In some of the most remarkable footage to emerge from the war, you see how the Victorian anti-tank regiment literally stuck to its guns, wiping out a Japanese tank convoy. Four men, 11 tanks. They are the type who will keep this country white. They must have hit one and hit one at the and then hit one at the back and they couldn't turn round. And between hand grenades from the troops on the top of the bank and the two pounders, they skittled them. Jim Howard was with the New South Wales 2nd 19th Battalion, which soon found itself in a perilous position. The Japanese pattern of using the sea to outflank the Allies was repeated. Sea Company was given the job then of uh, clearing the, the machine guns, and we did. We lost a few men in the process, of course, but... Uh, How did you do it? With bayonets. You charged the bullets? Had to, yeah. Yeah, had a couple of, well, a few near misses, but that was all part of the game. And uh, one, <laughs> the Sergeant Major of, of C Company, he had been a... A wheat tosser, uh, you know, tossing the big sieves of wheat, he was built like a... Uh, he got one bloke on the end of his plane and threw him over his shoulder. They battled for four days and nights along this road. The Australians were trying to make it back to their lines at Parrot Sulong, ahead of their headquarters at Yongpeng. When they finally reached the bridge here at Parrot Sulong, they found the Japanese again in control and anticipated relief by British forces unrealised. We were very critical of them. We don't feel that they tried to <laughs> you know, put any of the effort into, that we'd put in to get the 15 k's to Parrot Sulong Bridge. In February this year, some of the survivors made it back. In this place of so many memories of mateship and suffering, of atrocities and cruelty. They remembered their comrades, the wounded they were forced to leave behind. I left him a couple of white towels and uh, I said to him, Ray, I feel a, a certain person leaving you like this. I knew his wife, I knew his kids. We'd soldiered together in the New South Wales Scottish Regiment. He said, Jim, you do what you're ordered and bloody get out now and pick up these fellas. He said, you've been told to do a job, do it, off.
Just behind the tappers' quarters next to the bridge, an estimated 150 Australian and Indian soldiers, the wounded they left behind, were machine gunned, then burned, some of them while still alive. They shall grow not old, as we who are left grow old. Age will not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Lest we forget. Lest we forget. The massacre is not forgotten, nor the accompanying breakout from Parrot Sulong. Through the swamps, the mire and the Japanese, small parties of men, many of them wounded, all of them left to their own initiative, struggled to rejoin the fight. There was 33 in the party that were able to walk after a fashion. I remember one bloke had his heel shot off his right heel. He walked on the ball of his foot for 20 odd miles. We reckon we were far enough away to light a fire, so we got a bit of dry leaves and stuff. And uh, the only thing we had to cook the rice in was a tin hat, which had been on someone's sweaty head for days. Uh, ripped the inside out of it and poured the rice in. And I often think about the, the rice cooked in the, in the tin hat and in the swamp. You'll eat anything, won't you, if you're hungry? Colonel Charles Anderson won a Victoria Cross for his fighting withdrawal. Thousands of Allied soldiers narrowly escaped the Japanese trap and General Bennett escaped a near disaster. A fighting retreat is part of every army manual, uh, but it wasn't in Bennett's book. <laughs> well, it might have been in his book, but it wasn't in his mind. And so he, the, the, the Australians in, in, in the Malay and Singapore were not taught how to retreat. Let's have less of this, we're not taught to retreat, and more of this, uh, what a damn good retreat was conducted indeed. I mean, it's a near miracle that anybody got away from that gauntlet behind uh, Bakri and Parrot Salong. And one of the best deserved Victoria Crosses that must ever have been awarded went to Colonel Anderson of the 19th, in that he got anybody out alive at all from that mess. With the last natural defences on the Malayan Peninsula gone, the cablegrams between Canberra and London became less polite. We are face to face with the scrabble of our sheer existence. In one communication, Australian Prime Minister John Curtin complained that a failure to reinforce Singapore amounted to an inexcusable betrayal, despite Australia being party to the original fraud of the Singapore strategy. Now, it seems to me, um, if you take that line over almost 20 years, um, it's a bit rich to then come back and say, uh, people betrayed us when you willingly went along with the assumptions that, frankly, were flawed from the very beginning. Canberra and London moved to confront a mounting disaster. 3,000 Australian reinforcements, most of them untrained, were rushed to Singapore, arriving in the last week of January. We had one fella came into our mob, called Bob Bag, I think his name, came from, came from Tasmania, as a matter of fact, and he had been in the army something like three or four weeks, and he never fired a rifle. He never fired a rifle. When I got to Singapore, I was given a Bren gun, and I knew nothing about a Bren gun. I'd never have fired one in my life. 19 years old Roy Cornford was one of over 600 reinforcements assigned to the New South Wales 19th Battalion, depleted to a third its full strength after Muir. So there was no morale at all because we met the blokes who had been trapped at Muir and when they come back and told us what was going on and how they battled to get back, the Japs were just getting around them and they had to battle through them again to get back. And they said that we'll have no hope of holding them in Singapore. London also responded with too little too late, sending some aircraft and diverting from the Middle East a division of soldiers kitted for a different war. We were passing 
wrecked ships. I don't know which they were, we, we never found out. But it, it, you know, it looked a bit menacing as you came in. We were, we, you know, we, <laughs> you had the feeling like things are not going to be quite right at this place. On the last day of January 1942, the Allied rear guard withdrew to Singapore Island, blowing a hole in the causeway behind them, cutting off their own main water supply. Upon arrival on the island, weary Australians were astonished to discover defences along the northern shoreline had not been prepared. They were not able to lay mines or dig trenches in what amounted to a tidal swamp. The story goes that the uh, governor had uh, put the kibosh on uh, putting up barbed wire entanglements and defences but because it would have been bad for the morale of the civilian population. Bad for morale. <laughs> it was bad for our morale when it bleak was started and we never had, never had the stuff to go with the men. In February this year, a party of international historians gathered on the same shoreline. Die and die well, and take a long time doing so. Stand and fight in place, and buy time for Malaya Command to realize that this is the main attack, that the all- After 60 years, the questions of what went wrong and who was to blame continue to raise hackles particularly between the British and Australians. For Australia, uh, I'm always struck by the emotional difference in the reaction of the two nations to this. For those British individuals who were personally involved in the fall of Singapore, well, of course, this is always a defining moment in their lives. But for the rest of the nation, it, it, it's always seemed to me, as a Canadian watching my two imperial cousins, that it matters far more to you Australians as a nation. To you, it was the near north. To the British, it was the far east. The Australians were given this section of the northwestern shoreline to defend, where the Straits of Johor narrow to 500 metres. Fresher British forces were concentrated more on the other side of the causeway. I think Percival must accept some of the blame here. Um, I mean, the story we hear is that Wavell said the Japanese attack would be on the northwest of the island. Percival thought it would be on the northeast and ultimately disposed the larger part of his forces there. The pride of Fortress Singapore, the big naval guns, were turned on amassing Japanese with little effect. And from the tower of the Sultan of Johor's palace on the other side, Japanese spotters were able to target return fire directly upon the Australians. It came in curtains, the curtain of fire, and then it lifted about 20 yards, another curtain of fire come down. This went on all for 18 hours. And then there was this horrible silence. And then, after five minutes or so, this machine gun, the rat a tat tat of the machine guns. On the night of February 8, 1942, 13,000 Japanese soldiers crossed in the first wave. Spread out along 15 kilometres opposing them were around 3,000 Australian combat troops many of them the inexperienced reinforcements. Well, the Japs run into us and they start babbling in Japanese and then they realised that we were Japanese and then they started to run and all the men threw themselves on the ground and fired at them. That's when I fired one magazine of the Bren gun. We just stormed into the enemy and went on a rampage. A little mate of mine, he, he's Spanish, he's dead now. And he, uh, he was running with a team of blokes, like when they said, we've got to withdraw, pull out. And he turned to the bloke like that, and he said, Jesus, there's, there's millions of the bastards, you know, and this bloke would go, yeah, 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 you use the Jap. <laughs> he was running with a team of Japs. <laughs> the Japanese strategy was to rush through the Australian lines and capture the Tanga airfield to the rear. 
the Japanese lost heavily with 1,000 casualties alone in Maseo Maeda's division. We cut through the enemy lines at night. We were riddled with bullets like honeycomb. That's where many of my friends died. The Australians also lost heavily. One casualty who fell to exhaustion rather than bullets was the 22nd Brigade commander, Harold Taylor. Taylor was wandering around rather like a man in a sleepwalk. He was uh, utterly, uh, utterly, you know, shell-shocked and not able to do very much. I'm not at all surprised it would have taken Superman to cope with the burden that was put on Taylor's shoulders. Yes, he buckled. Yes, he made a mistake in a premature retreat to Percival's final perimeter, and that was unfortunate. But given the difficulties that he worked with, Taylor simply cracked under overwhelming pressure. Criticism of Australian leadership is not confined to Bennett and Taylor. Brigadier Duncan Maxwell was also condemned for withdrawing his troops from their vital defence of the causeway. I think Maxwell certainly didn't believe, and we know that from his interview with Percival, that the island should be fought for. He thought it was all lost, and that we might as well give up at that point. While the Australians bore the brunt of the assault, they were but a small component of the Allied forces on the island. Opposing approximately 30,000 attacking Japanese were around 85,000 Allied troops. A very large proportion of them support troops, such as postal units, the mobile bath, field bakeries and the like. Still others were never brought to bear on the conflict. Our lot, we were just wandering about there. They, they kind of um, said we're going to have to fight, give you all this kind of talk. Uh, we're going to fight to the death, there's no Dunkirk, there's nobody going to rescue you, so take as many as you can with you before you go. It's all heroic stuff, you know. <clears throat> and we're in this uh, big cellar, and we barricaded it, sandbagged it, made it a, a, a pillbox type. But uh, we'd, wep we'd all weapons there, but you didn't know to shoot at. Meanwhile, Australians, cut off from their units, were trying to make it back to safety. We had no officers, no nothing. There was uh, probably 15 or 20 of us, but there was, I wouldn't say there was even anybody above a private. The mob we were following went uh, straight out and they put a bayonet charge on. I lost my rifle and bayonet when I was swimming in the river. Someone opened up with a machine gun and I went down the bottom. And I lost my tin app with all my wallet and my money and everything and my rifle. But uh, it wasn't hard to pick up another rifle. There was dead blokes laying everywhere. And, uh, but there was no bayonet with it. So I went in a bayonet charge without a bayonet. For the Australians, this was no Gallipoli. For the British, no Dunkirk. With no hope of relief, the fight went on, but by the third day, it was no longer a cohesive defence. There was a whole line of military trucks with Australian soldiers, young men, totally bewildered. And uh, one of them offered me his rifle. He says, take it. My heart was in my pit of my stomach. Bennett himself said that in his final perimeter, he only had 2,000 men. Now, there were 18,500 Australians uh, on, on the island. Uh, so where did the others go to? The Japanese lost almost half their battle dead for the entire Malayan campaign on Singapore Island itself. And I would be very surprised if nothing less than 80 plus percent of those were killed by Australians. Uh, I can see no evidence that they didn't put up a fight at all for the island. Later gave up on the fight? Yes, perhaps. Didn't put up a fight at all? Rubbish.
With the Japanese advance came a creeping spread of chaos and tragedy. The nurses were ordered to leave the hospitals ahead of Japanese massacres, particularly of the local Chinese population. The last evacuation ship would leave on Friday, the 13th of February. In the preceding days, there was mayhem along the waterfront. There was thousands and thousands of, uh, of Australians roaming about and looting. We could hardly get in at all. And when we got down to the docks, uh, to the ship, God, they were the gangway and could hardly get them down off the gangway. When we got to the dock gates, there were a, a crowd of Aussies round there arguing with the red caps, uh, let us in, you know. And, and, uh, but there was also English blokes uh, and others all in a similar boat, all looking for a way out. You couldn't blame them. The Aussies were more open about it. They were shouting like typical Australian. You know. Our lads were standing there and thought, well, if they go in, we'll go with them. While many defenders had given up the fight, many others continued to resist. Here we were in a, a perimeter that hadn't been broken. Um, the Japs had tried to come through the perimeter two or three times, we'd repulse, repulse them, uh, and the next minute we're told to throw our arms down, to stack them in a pile and just don't do anything. One week after the Japanese began their invasion of the island, one month ahead of schedule, Singapore fell, and so too, an unaccustomed silence. I think my first thought was, blimey, I've survived. The one question I think that probably st stood out even on that first night of surrender, what will our people back home think? A lot of them sat doing were crying. And uh, I was crying myself, actually. They marched 80,000 troops from the city to Changi. And they were, I wouldn't say marching, just moving uh, for nearly 36 hours. I, I've never felt so depressed in my whole life. I mean, the, it's just like as if the dark ages had descended. The battle was over, but the war of words went on. Supreme Commander of the region, Archibald Wavell, produced a report in 1942 which, for the sake of imperial relations, was kept secret for 50 years. Within it, there is scathing commentary of the Australians. General Bennett's 1944 account of why Singapore fell, in turn, laid significant blame on the British. More recently, British author Peter Elphick has joined the half-century-old argument, finding that desertion, particularly among Australians, played a big part in the ultimate collapse. Uh, the major factor, uh, factor was the low morale that they talked about at these, uh, these last uh, uh, generals' meetings. Uh, but low morale, uh, meaning, i.e., desertion, because it was on a major scale then. 
Uh, on the outcome, I think they had no impact at all. I think there were desertions. On what scale, I couldn't be definitive, but I think not, not large, but not surprising. The death of an army trapped like a cornered rat is never tidy. Come on, let's face it, this army was disintegrating, it was messy. Were there Australians in there? Yes, of course. But were they predominant? Well, it seems to me that they were remembered, yeah. Does that mean they were predominant? That's tougher. Over 1,000 of the 18,000 Australians in Singapore did get out in the last days. Among them, most of the mobile laundry unit, some of the mobile bath, and a World War I Victoria Cross winner. A smaller number made it back to Australia. Many thought that there was much else the renowned Australian leader might have said, but in war, there are many things that are better left unsaid. I'm not here to answer criticisms as to how or why I came back to Australia. Prominent among these was General Bennett, who escaped directly following the surrender. I saw a report signed by two British officers who had just come from behind the Japanese lines and who had seen a number of our Australian prisoners at that time. And they stated very definitely that the Australian prisoners who were being held by the Japanese were being very well treated indeed. He gave his men an express order on the evening of February 15th that nobody was to leave their position. And then he rounded up a few of his cronies and did so himself. Uh, far, frankly, as a former soldier, I find that repugnant. I think he left his men to face the music. His claim was that he had information about how the Japanese fought, which turned out to be absolute rubbish. Uh, there was nothing particularly new in what he had to say, and uh, that was the end of Gordon Bennett. An inquiry into General Bennett's escape was generally forgiving, but did find his departure not justified. Other documents reveal no evidence of Australians court-martialed for desertion from Singapore. And in their reading, it's clear that courage and initiative had not deserted many who did get out. You know, I was 22, 23. <laughs> Perhaps not, not, not gifted with many brains. But we, uh, we, we were pretty fiery, I suppose, in, in spirit. And uh, if we couldn't go on back to the battalion, the battalion was like your home. And, uh, well, we wanted, uh, we did not want the bloody Japanese to take us. In his book, Singapore, the Pregnable Fortress, Peter Elphick, relying on many secondary sources, has repeated a well-worn story of alleged forced entry and mass desertion by Australians who boarded this ship, the Empire Star. They were led, he wrote, by a Captain Blackwood. There's no record of Captain Blackwood in the 8th Division. What do you make of that? Uh, well, maybe they got the, the name wrong. One to get away on the Empire Star was Roy Cornford, the other Australian named by Elphick as a deserter. Well, we sort of split up. Some said, well, we're going this way and we're going that way. And I went with four blokes and we pushed through the jungle and we spent another night... You'll remember Roy Cornford as one of the untrained reinforcements who, before the surrender, was left cut off and leaderless. And we got in this little boat and eventually we got out in the water and... We're paddling and thinking we're going somewhere to the heading towards Singapore docks where you could see smoke and everything. But then in the distance we saw we could see two ships. But we made for the closest one and we could see hundreds or we reckon hundreds of so soldiers on it. And they lowered a, a scrambling net and pulled us on board. Cornford was put to work defending the ship against attack by Japanese aircraft. Upon arrival in Java, he was briefly detained before volunteering to return to the line until captured by the Japanese. He endured enslavement for the entire construction of the notorious Burma Railway. He was then marched aboard another ship, the Rikuyo Maru, bound for more forced labour camps in Japan. 
On September 17, 1944, the ship was sunk by an American submarine and Roy Cornford was left to flounder in an oil-stained sea. We tied two rafts together and there was 18 of us. But when we got rescued four days later, there was only seven of us of that 18 alive. Remarkably, an American cameraman was there in the middle of the ocean to film the rescue. You'd be pretty fond of the Americans, wouldn't oh, you? Well, I am, yes. I'll, uh, I'll tell you, I am very fond of the Americans. You've also named a, a Roy Cornford, yeah. you say a deserter by his own admission. Yeah. Uh, this he denies. Um, he gives a good account of, of what happened to him. Indeed, he, he joined the front line again when he was uh, returned to Java. Were you wrong to call him a deserter? No, I, 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 well, I, if I am wrong, then so was the author of the book uh, who actually interviewed Roy Colden. And, and he said that Roy Colden, on his own admission, was a, was a, a deserter. And I, I, I took that verbatim from the, the book. Did I you talk it, to Roy Cornford? No, I didn't. But you should have, shouldn't you, if you're going to call uh, him a deserter? Well, it, it, it's, a, it's a moot point. It, it would have been worth my, worth my while to a journey out to Australia to interview one man. I, I, I don't think so. Roy Cornford returned from the war to lead an exemplary life. The prisoner of war experience improved his appreciation of life. In his retirement, he sells plants to raise money for charity. So you better help me pull the weeds out of them. Well, when are you going to take them into Nara? Uh, huh? As soon as we get time. Right. He blames no one for the horrors he endured. Like many of the men, he says the British and Australians got to know one another better following captivity. Well, at first, I, I thought a bit... Uh, their attitude was like, uh, sounded aggressive and abrupt, you know. What do you want, you bloody pour me my ass? And, you know, they go, and I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm here to be friendly and he's talking to me like this. Anyway, once you got to know them and you give it them back, it, it was just their way. And uh, if they took to you, that was it. You're a good mate, a good cobber, as you used to call you. Their camps were discipline and uh, as I say they all work together this is my opinion and I love them I love them there is no doubt some Australian soldiers did desert the fighting in Singapore 60 years ago there is no doubt there was a breakdown of order in those last chaotic days when British and Australian leadership failed. Not surprising, considering this was a battle lost by our leaders before the soldiers arrived. So to blame the men, to blame the victims, is cruel and absurd. Australian casualties through all of the fighting were by far the highest. The nature of the fighting was such that in the space of a month, they experienced more intense combat than many soldiers did through an entire war. And for these men, there was no time to learn, no second chance. Their story of three and a half years' captivity went on to eclipse the story of their war. Sixty years on, in their final years, it is worth remembering they were fighters before they were prisoners. Just thank people and whilst you met, they will never forget, they'll forget me not last. Rainy days don't worry me There's 
a rainbow that I can see. And it's waiting for me down forget me not that. Fortune never comes that way. I'll keep singing a song each day. Keeping troubles away from forget me not way. 